Not just a professor, my favorite professor, so. <laughs> I mean that. Great, happy to be here. Uh, it, it, it really is fun to come back. Um, and I mentioned, I, I used to always park in, it was 17A back when I went to school, and now it's 17G. So that's not too much change in the parking lot. So um, I'm working on a really fun project right now, and that's what I'm going to be talking about. Um, for those of you who know Seattle, that roadway, that elevated roadway, state highway that is along the waterfront uh, is coming down. And a tunnel is starting to be built. And the city is then faced with an absolutely fantastic question, which is, how do we make this a very wonderful waterfront? What, what do we do? And they uh, uh, hired a team of designers and engineers who I'm managing to help the city deal with that question. So. Um, I'm going to walk through uh, that discussion with you. I want to keep it very casual, uh, and I'll, I won't take, take too long, and, and we can be available to take questions also with, it, from anybody who wants to talk as long as they want. So this is, uh, C most of you probably know Seattle, this is the viaduct. And it is a 80-foot elevated, two-stacked roadway that absolutely cuts off any hope of the waterfront feeling like it's part of the downtown. It's noisy. It served its purpose. And like a lot of cities, they're going back to their waterfronts, including Bellingham, obviously, and saying, all right, there was a reason we did it that way 50, 60, 70 years ago. Whether it was a railroad or an industrial plant or an elevated highway, but it's time for a change. And uh, so we're one of those cities. Uh, it's happening across the country, and it's a really exciting trend. This is, I'll be showing you more images of this, but this again takes the, you know, the question is, how can we end up with a, a boulevard with an esplanade? How can we redo our piers? How, we, how can we connect to Pike Place Market? All those things that don't exist today, what might be a good way to, to get, make that happen? Again, I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. We're really proud of where we are. We're excited about it. But um, I'd like to talk a little bit about what makes great projects like this move to the next phase, because sometimes that doesn't happen. And these are the type of things, from my experience on working on projects, are ingredients that say if you can have these things lined up well, you increase your odds of actually making that last picture I saw, a reality. And a, a lot of it comes from inspiration, and that's inspiration both in terms of purpose, why you're doing it, clearly design, and whether that design fits the basic values of, of the community and, 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 and what this facility, whether it's a building or a public realm 2.2 miles long, uh, is meant to serve. And finally, it's the inspiration and leadership. And that can come from a variety of sources. It can come from city council. It can come from a university. It can come from students. Um, but it has to be there. It has to be strong. And it has to be beyond and outside just the design effort. And the interesting part about it is, is you can have a great purpose and you can have a great design. But if you don't have great leadership, it won't happen. And so that's, you know, as any city addresses these type of major development projects, you have to ask yourself, have we lined up the leadership, not just politics, outside community that can ride this through? And the leadership has to stay often in a positive form. It can't, you know, it's easy to get adrenaline pump for negative. There needs to be adrenaline pump for, a pump for positive, and that's the type of leadership you need on these projects to carry it out. Project momentum is another thing. People will, when I talk about project management, they'll say, well, you know, you've got schedule, budget, and design, those three things. Project momentum is as tangible as any one of those elements. And you know you have it when you have it. And you should grasp it and hang on to it and work it as hard as you can. Because Western has, I know, a great basketball team. They did when I was here as well. And you can go watch a basketball game and you can almost 
point when a momentum swing happens. And so if you're at the end of the, you know, the first half and you're feeling good, you got all this, but you lose that momentum in the second half, strange things can happen. So project momentum is everything, and it, it starts with a sense of urgency early on. How do you build it? How do you keep the right pace? Um, another thing I feel really strong about projects, you can try to go too fast. You can also go too slow. And if I have a worry, I'll talk about these things in the presentation a bit more, but the waterfront, we have a little bit too much time maybe, and that causes people to want to rethink things, and there's some danger in that. I am a planner. I'm proud to be a planner. I was taught to be a planner. That said, there is an orbit of planning that happens on these big projects, and, and you have to find a way to break out of that. The Seattle waterfront's a great idea, it's going to happen. Bellingham's waterfront's a great idea, it's going to happen and be great. But there's a tendency to spin, and you have to find out how do you get out of that planning orbit. That's, a, that's something that has to be thought about hard and, and worked in terms of, again, momentum moving forward rather than momentum circling around. And finally, there's a stick to itness or a continuity, a sense from the leadership that we are going to stick with this. These type of projects aren't one year projects, they're not five year projects, they're decade long projects, and you have to get people involved who are prepared for that type of an effort. It's not just, I'm going to be on a committee for a, a, a year or two. I'm, I want to see this to the end, and I think that's a really important thing. Finally, on the other side, broaden the base. We all know this. How do you get a, a, a strength with your partners, whether it's a port authority, in our case it's Pike Place Markets, it's the Washington State Ferries, it's the aquarium. How do you pull them in with a common vision? We have seen around the country on these type of projects that a friends of, we have a friends of the waterfront, friends of the High Line Project, friends of Millennium Park in Chicago, friends of a hospital, friends outside the institution that's doing it in the public institutions because they can do things a little differently, a little more aggressively. They can cause a little bit more trouble in a positive way. Uh, the, uh, if, th that is usually a pretty good sign that this thing's going to have some staying power. I also talk about in terms of broadening that base, you broaden that base by people wanting to be inside your project. So when you see these images, people constantly say to us, I really would, I'd love to, I want to be there. I want to be in that picture. And so a lot of these pictures are nice, and we want people to want to, want to be there. Early wins are important, um, even if they're simple. Uh, when we started this two and a half years ago, we were about a year into it. We're excited about what we were doing, but we say, how do we get people to come back to the waterfront with that viaduct there? How do we just do something that signals we're starting to do things? And we uh, have uh, the, the Waterfront Seattle uh, uh, logo. So we stenciled, if you will, or painted on the, uh, one of the old piers, uh, the logo. And then we went to Home Depot and bought about 50 of these yellow chairs for like 10 bucks each and just started putting them around the waterfront. People loved it. It sounds so simple. It was so inexpensive. But all of a sudden, people were going, I want to sit in the waterfront. You know, and, and as soon as someone got up, the chair would be filled on a day like this as if with somebody else. So that's, that's the simple win end of it, and it's meaningful. Be, behind that, I will go, there's also the Ferris wheel. That's, a, that's an early win. It's not as simple as the chairs, though. But it, uh... <laughs> so, and finally, and I believe this, great projects attract money. Too often organizations stop and go, well, we need to have all the money in the bank before we get going. And I think there's, you know, there's critique of public agencies and be careful. You have to be careful, but phase things, get part of the project going, get the excitement that people can go. That's really good, and, and money, money can follow that. So I'm going to show you a lot of pictures. We're, again, proud of where we're at. We'll talk about that. But these themes are there, and I'll probably refer back to them in some of the pictures. All right. Sense of urgency. This is real. Get out of the planning mode. The south end of the viaduct uh, was torn down. There's no doubt in Seattle after you know, a decade, more than decades, of what's going to happen to the waterfront. We had to start tackling this, uh, this issue of the waterfront because the water, no doubt the viaduct's coming down. 
So we put together an organization, or the city did, that had up to the left of the Central Waterfront Committee, which is a group of 45 community leaders that are as good as you can get, who are in it for the long term, have that stick to itness, get, have ridden some of these projects, the full arc of planning through implementation. They've worked with public development authorities. They're good. And even though technically my boss is the city, uh, there's another boss and it's that committee. And, and they are a wonderful group of people. Inside the city, there's three departments who all play really big roles, uh, both the Parks Department, the Planning Department, and uh, the par uh, plan uh, Parks and Recreation. And then, you know, the bottom there, you see the Friends. Six months ago, a nonprofit was formed called Friends of Waterfront Seattle. They now have an executive director. And again, if you look across the country, those type of independent, slightly outside Friends of Groups uh, really can help things move along. And then finally, the community. And we started off with a theme of waterfront for all. We worked that very hard. I've really never been involved with a project that had this amount of enthusiasm associated with it. We had several public meetings that had 1,000 people show up. I've never had public meetings of a project I'm working on that 1,000 people. I've had ones with 300 or 400, but use about, usually more than half of them are mad. And they're mad at me. <laughs> and what are you doing? This, we, it, 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 I don't want to say it was a love-in, but people in Seattle get the waterfront. They're attached to the waterfront. They wanted to talk about the question we asked over and over again is, where do you see yourself on the waterfront? What do you want to do? Do you want to play Frisbees? Do you want to walk? Do you want a cafe? What are the things you want to do? So we, went, we carried out a really good program, took it very seriously, and we're still carrying it out. We're, you know, we're just in that stage where that question will get to be. But if you grow up in Seattle, just like if you grow up in Bellingham, these type of views, the icons that happen out in the water um, are as good as it gets. And we are embracing this idea that we are next to, or reality, not an idea, next to the industrial zone, which makes it interesting as opposed to a problem. In fact, early on, in some of the planning efforts that happened a decade ago, they were saying, we need to move the ferries because they cause traffic congestion. And a few of us, myself included, said, are you nuts? The ferries are an icon. Not only that, they bring in 10 million people down along the waterfront. Keep them, embrace them, and, and uh, that's what we're doing in our plan. This is a shot of another public realm project, and this is one in New York uh, called the High Line. It's probably right now one of the most renowned public space projects, I'm going to say, in the world. Uh, uh, James Corner Field, uh, James Corner Field Operations did it. It's an elevated railway in Chelsea, a portion of Manhattan that used to be a, in the meat packing district. They used to move the meat around in an elevated roadway. It was going to be torn down, and instead, a few wise people said, we, "Why don't we build a park there?" And it is. If you have not been there, the next time you go to New York City, go. It's magical. And we hired that designer to come work with us in Seattle. It was a, you know, we had a lot of wonderful local architects, but we felt what has been able to do here was about the type of thing we were looking for, though a very different product, but the feel, the excitement, and we wanted a fresh set of eyes. And when Jim came in, he really did a good job working with the public and uh, the elected officials, the works, talking about the three scales that we were looking at on that waterfront, both the, the city scale and how it uh, you know, wraps around Elliott Bay, that it really is a circle. And for a lot of us, including me, <laughs> I've lived my, almost my whole life in Seattle, you, you tend to think of it as a flat waterfront, but the, it, it really is, is circled around and, and has the magnolia and the alki. And then how do we city scale tie the waterfront back into the city, something that we'd almost forgotten about how important that was because the viaducts blocked it for, for so long. And then finally, the waterfront scale itself. So as we looked at the waterfront, um, if you look, this is, uh, this is, is it, you know, Century Link Field now. This is, the stadiums are here. And what the neighborhoods who engaged with us said, we don't want just a homogeneous two miles, 26 blocks waterfront. We all have our own character. So how do we keep some level of consistency in what we're doing? For those who want to go the entire length from the stadiums to the sculpture park, having that sense of continuity, but recognizing that we have these zones. We have you know, the Pioneer Square. We have where the ferries come in, and we're linking and improving the transit connections there all over the city. So there's really a transit hub zone there. 
There are the commercial piers um, that are there. Some of the tenants in there are the ones that, when I was 15 years old, are still there. So there needs to be some level of renovation. But still, get uh, you know, Ivers is there. There's a lot of fun stuff that still can happen in the waterfront. And it's an important part of it, an important part of its history. Um, the aquarium, Pike Place Market, and then finally the Belltown area. So again, we looked at that and said, all right, how do we approach this project both as a continuous waterfront, but also reflecting the neighborhoods that, that, that it goes along. This is actually from the north end looking back because one of the things that we, we will be doing when the viaduct comes down, there still will be a, a roadway, four lane roadway on the waterfront, but we will, it will be, be moving from right along the piers to the footprint of where the viaduct is today, which opens up a promenade of 80, 100 feet of walkway that we'll, you'll see pictures of here that really makes it a wonderful place. But around the country, roadways, you know, there were some people saying, let's not put a roadway at all. It needs to be done. And there's, a very, you know, there's no reason we can't put that type of uh, uh, facility there and just have it work really well. But going to the south, we're looking at opportunities of how we reopen at least some of the, the, the beaches. Um, so that something that really was lost to Seattle a long time ago, there's one of those that was done at the north at the end of the sculpture park. Do we do one of those down in the Pioneer Square area? This is, just shows an image of that, um, the uh, Washington State Ferry Terminal area, how we, how we do in a smaller scale what they did in New York City with Grand Central Station, which is you have 10 million people coming on those ferries. If you watch when they get off the ferries today, they, and if you do it yourself, you come in and you're going, my God, this is as great of a way to get to the city and the world. But when you land, you go like, you know, there's, there's nothing there. How do, we, how do we make it so the terminal is a great facility and something that has the type of, of uses that both regular users can use, but how do we also find places where visitors or people who live there just want to take their kids can come watch the ferries go back and forth? I know Bob Donegan really well is a wonderful fellow who's the CEO of, of Ivers. But right now, the best place and almost the only place to have a good shot of the ferries where you can sit and relax and watch is his restaurant. And uh, we need to find some public places where that same type of viewing can happen. And so the terminal is an important one. Obviously, uh, uh, re making it so riding a bike on the waterfront is a, something all of us want to do. The roadway, though, it will be there. How do we take? all the roadway, but especially the intersections and make them pedestrian friendly uh, and, and then again the type of places that you're comfortable with. If you think, think about this one now, the east side of the viaduct, and for those of you getting familiar with it, you know this. If you're not, you have this basically wall. So all of the businesses on the east side have turned their back to the viaduct. And the back is where their loading docks are. So the issue now is how do you take those and do what Yale Town's done? I know everybody up here knows Yale Town. Um, or the Pearl District in Portland. How do you take it and make them cool, unique, fun places for, uh, uh, for, you know, for dining and hanging out? And the property uh, along the east side of the viaduct are starting to change hands already with that in mind. This is, I'm going to point to it and explain to it a little bit. This is the part of the project that is probably is the boldest. Um, this is the Pike Place Market, the existing Pike Place Market here. This is the aquarium here. And right today, here are these two institutions that are loved, but you, there's very few people walk back and forth or have a sense. They might get in their car and drive to the aquarium. So the issue is how do we take Pike Place Market and we're calling it an Overlook Walk, and create, and James Corner doesn't like when I say this because you never want to tell an architect that we want something like that, but you take that, um, the Highline type project and say, how can you create a walk that you just love to sort of walk and, 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 and take in the views, sit, stroll, and then come down a set of stairs that either you hit the aquarium or one of the public piers that will be rebuilt uh, and I'll show you some pictures of that. Can yeah. For the quick question. Is, yeah. Is that, is that planning on, on re repurposing the existing via surface there? The, the roadway, here's the roadway. I'm sorry, this sorry. is the new road. I'm wondering about the elevator. No, 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 no. This is, this is not counted. It's entirely new. 
We're still playing with, is there any part of the viaduct that you would save? I and I, and, and we, I will say, in the public process, there were a lot of people, I grew up in Seattle, I, I grew up in, more than that, I grew up in South Seattle. So when you drive into the city, you'd be up on that viaduct. And it truly is one of the most spectacular, in fact, why there aren't more accidents of all of us going like that, I don't know. But um, it's going to fall down. And so you know, the issue, issue is, and so what we, when we got to the core of going to the people who really wanted to save it, mainly they were after the views. And so, so right here, it's the equivalent. You're up there, but it just is on a, a, a new feature. So it, uh, there may be down the end, we're still, and we've got some artists who are thinking about it as well. This is the Pike Place Market. They are working with a, an architect called Miller Hull, David Miller, fantastic architect in Seattle. Um, at expanding on a, a, big, a vacant parking lot, their facility, doing anything in the market's tricky. Because it's such a beloved facility, you, no one wants to tamper with it too much. But we're working that through and feel, again, like we've hit a really sweet spot that would, that would take, again, this is the, the old markets back here. It would connect to this new development, and then you start this walk down to the aquarium and the waterfront back and forth. And we'd have, we'll have some assists, too, and I'll show you, talk about that. So this is the type of walkway zigging, zigzagging back and forth I talked about. Places to sit, think, take in the view. And that's another thing. When you talk to people, a lot of them just said, "I just, I just want to stroll. I, you know, I, I, I just want to be there." And I want to. We all know, both in Bellingham and Seattle, when it is a nice day, and you can sit and look out over the sound. It's as good as it gets. And Corner, who again right now is in demand all around the world, he just finished up the Olympics. He's working in Hong Kong and Taiwan and all just. He's, in terms of a pure palette of where you start, he says it just doesn't get any better than, than Seattle. I mean, just, so he loves this. He thinks it uh, is very pleased with the work. And uh, this is where you come down. And the stairway would lead then onto a public pier. And the public pier would be, again, part of, part of that experience. I, have, I need to show you this. This is really cool. We. One of the parts of the project that we're looking at, it looks like they're jumping in the sound, right? Well, they're not. They're jump, jumping into a swimming pool. And the swimming pool is a barge. The, they've been done around the world. There's a, this is the one that's been done in New York. You can go to the uh, Nep NeptuneFoundation.com. And a woman said, I want more kids swimming. She got a barge donated and built this. And I am really high on this one. I think that both in um, Seattle and Bellingham, we should tie up one of these. Get, go to one of the barge builders and say, Turn, get, let, us, let us scour that out. And uh, we're going to make this happen on the Seattle waterfront. And it'll be like swimming in the sound, but a little bit warmer, which is even better, right? <laughs> um, this gives you, again, a sense the shot of, of the hangout of the aquarium right now. When you go to the aquarium, a little bit like the, the Washington State Ferries, you you quickly get off and go into the aquarium. We don't have any sense that. So we're working really hard with them on the type of plaza that all of the small little plazas that would be in the promenade are not only places just to hang out, but where you can have small performances and, uh, again, make it just a really part of the waterfront experience. I like that one. This is uh, another one of the public piers. The city owns this. It, the current design is a disaster, and just no one really spends time there. The idea is to straighten it out, open it up, put in a water feature of some type. I think we all know these water features are pretty, pretty work well with public realm projects. But just as important, when the water features aren't going, have a draining so that you could shut it down and have a concert at night or a Christmas celebration. All of these are meant to be flexible spaces, but all of them are meant to be uh, spaces where that we don't have on the waterfront now because we don't have room and we don't, we, the, the noise level is so high you just don't hang out. A lot of this is hangout space. Some of it will be cafes. What you are not seeing along here is major towers like in Vancouver, BC and the rest. Uh, we all love, I love Vancouver, BC. I love what they've done. But as we spent time with um, the community, they said, we want to connect back into the city, but we don't necessarily want a whole new set of pin towers uh, you know, on the waterfront, and we're respecting that. This slide is really important because it emphasizes 
work we're doing on all of the east west streets so again this is the downtown this is the waterfront project we're talking about but we've for so long thought of the waterfront as a linear waterfront on the edge of seattle we need to emphasize no 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 so we've got the, the overlook walk connection up to the market we've got where the harbor steps are and union street here that will be worked through down in pioneer square if you stop on first avenue today and you're a block and a half away from the water and you were to just quickly say to your friend, how far are we from the water? You think five or six blocks, it's way, you, know, you can about throw a rock. And so the issue is all of these streets, once the viaduct comes down, will feel there and we need to pull in both directions. Uh, and uh, so, and all, on mo all, virtually all of those streets we're working right now with Corner and with those individual zones we talked about that said, how do you want your street to feel how do you want that connection to take place? And some of that, because in Seattle we do have the, uh, the vertical issues to deal with, we will put in some escalators. Some of those escalators will be bike friendly. Um, there is some conversation about uh, vehiculars or trams. I, I don't know where that goes, but uh, we, we will make certain that there will be walkability but of issues and, and the vertical issues will be dealt with as well. So this gives you a sense of schedule. Um, we, are, we have finished our concept design. It took us about two and a half years, ah, two years. The city council last August approved it nine to zero. And that was, you know, that, that's just sort of mind blowing. In fact, I kept saying to myself, did we do something wrong? Um, but but uh, really, so the work you're seeing here, and I, I really should, I should pass around a few of these here just in case someone wants to look at them while I'm talking, I honestly don't mind. Um, uh, if you want to just look and say, I'll start two here and then two down this way, you, I'll skip you. Um, the, w w the, the concept was approved um, and also, and I'm gonna hit it here, the schedule targets and a funding plan were all approved by the council. So we are in now our permitting process and moving the design to the next phase. The key milestone here is this. The tunnel that is being built under Seattle is scheduled to be done at the end of 2015. Immediately, the viaduct comes down. And when that viaduct comes down, we can start our construction. I want to emphasize, though, some, I talked about early winds earlier on. We are looking at like some of the east-west streets, some of the pier work, even the pool barge are some things that we can do early. We don't have to wait till 2016 to start getting more and more people coming to the waterfront and to start cementing in this design concept that, that we've, we've worked so hard on. The other piece of work that is being done is the seawall. The same time the construction is going on to not, the tunnel, we are reinforcing the seawall, which is a basic infrastructure need so that the city doesn't slide into the uh, bay when we put all this really cool stuff on it. So let's talk cost a little bit. We, we did something that uh, even the newspapers accepted, which I couldn't believe. They, they started off with, well, what, what's your budget? What's your budget for this waterfront? And we said, we don't have one. We're going to spend time talking about what we should do, what the community wants to do. And then we'll come back and go, well, how much does that cost? And maybe it costs too much, but we're not going to start out with, we have $500,000 designed to that. And the community and even the media let us do that, which I thought was quite interesting because I think they got the concept of let's, let's talk about what Seattle should do with a waterfront that has the potential to be one of the best waterfronts in the country. So here's what we ended up with, the, the total being a billion dollars. We struggled with the B. Are we really going to come out with a B? A B at the end of it? But we, we, uh, we did our estimate. So you've... You, we're going to be helping our partners. I talked early on about the importance of partners. We're helping both the aquarium and the market with um, some of their work because they're so important to the success of the waterfront. We've got the basic transportation infrastructure of the major roadway and the promenade. Um, new parks and open spaces, uh, just generally including the, the walk, the public piers, and then the seawall replacement. So, that's the pie that says this is what we did. We put these together. They're good cost estimates. They're good. They're probably slightly high, but not a lot. Um, we put in plenty of contingency. 
where they're fully loaded with all the soft costs. We wanted to say, if this is what we're targeting, we can build this, uh, we can deliver with this amount of money. So then we went back and said, all right, how's, how's this going to come together? Uh, Wash dot, uh, Department of Transportation had already agreed to about 290 million for rebuilding the roadway. So the roadway part of it was taken care of. Then we have this seawall. That, that is the basic infrastructure, both rebuilding the piers, but you can't do any of then Nothing is going to happen if you don't have the basic infrastructure in place. We had a $300 million issue there. So we went out to the voters last November and said, we need to do this. This waterfront plan can happen, but we need you to step up on this part of the infrastructure. We're going to pursue some other money outside the infrastructure. And... It, the measure, a $300 million measure passed with 77% yes. I was just shocked. In, in Seattle, nothing passes 77%. You know, you, if you can get anything over two-thirds, there's a third who vote no and everything, a third who vote yes, and you're fighting for the middle. So I don't know what we did here, but we, um, which means if you look at the money that basically had already the city had set up, we're over 60% money in the bank. And we've already started the discussions with the downtown area because when we were talking about the, the, the seawall, what was important to some of the voters when we were doing our polling, they're going, look, but the, the downtown's going to benefit on this a bit more than the rest of us. It's all our waterfront. So we are working on a 200 to $300 million local, which will be an assessment on property values, and we think we can do this. In fact, I'm quite confident we can. We've also talked to enough of the people who operate in circles that I don't, which is a high level of philanthropy. And um, with this in place, and if we get the local assessment district, they've all said, and I, they said, we can do this. And if you look across the country, the percentage of philanthropy that goes into these major public realm open spaces, that's clearly doable. Um, we will, we'll, somewhere between whether we use city general fund or another small a, a levy of 50 to 60 million dollars that rounds it out. So. Hundred, you know, a billion here, the billion the cost. This went to the council again, unanimous approval. Not, you know, to say go off first, do the vote, which happened, and now uh, proceed with the local improvement district, which we hope to have in place in about a year from now. So, how do I feel in terms of these ingredients? Recognizing we got a long way to go, I, I, I wouldn't trade places with any project anywhere. We, we've we've got great leadership. I think we shot for strong inspiration on the design and corner is brilliant. But just as important, I think we hit that fit on the design. It isn't too big, it isn't too s small and just plain. It's, it's something that, again, people seem to be relating to. We have the leadership in place with the committee and some of the council members that they're prepared to work the next decade to make certain that they are watching this get implement implemented. We have truly have momentum now. I'll go back to my basketball metaphor. We can lose it, but we are aware of that. And so the, the early wins, moving that forward, keeping in contact, broadening the base, this, uh, this bullet here of the friends of, getting them formed was a key, and that's happened now. They've hired their, their executive director. And if you hold to my theory that great projects attract the dollars, we'll be able to get that local assessment district formed sometime in the next year. So I like where we are. Thank you. I'd be happy to answer questions. Yeah. It's really exciting. Um, I have two questions that I didn't see on yours. Maybe something we're dealing with here in the city. Is one is cleanup cost, and the second one is the rail traffic. Yeah. Um, I can. Uh, let's start with the cleanup cost. The cleanup cost, primarily for us, or will be part of the seawall work. And so part of that $300 million bond measure is fixing the wall and then what's behind that wall. And there will be some, but I don't think it's quite the level of cleanup that you have, and I understand that. But we did go after that one in our discussion with the voters that, again, I just am so thrilled that they responded the way they did, was that's a basic issue. It's hard to get... Uh, uh, that's, that's something the city needs to take care of, and they got that, so that's where that is. On the rail traffic, um, we are somewhat fortunate that the rail tunnel 
is not along the waterfront here. It comes out, if you're familiar, it comes out sort of by the market and heads this way behind those condos. And so the core of the waterfront all the way down to the stadiums does not have, let's just be blunt, the coal train you know, threat. It doesn't mean anybody uh, uh, isn't nervous. I'll let the, you know, the council has already stated their position. They don't want it. The mayor is really aggressive. But if that were to happen, it isn't quite as, as uh, challenging as your project here on your waterfront. Yep. Yep. I think that's a really good idea, and people are, we're talking about that. We're okay. She she talked about some the history of these pairs is is wonderful. I mean, you know, I mean, it's just it's it's such a great story. So we've already put up some plaques, but more importantly, we've part of our team, uh, the design team, believe it or not, is a firm called Tomato, and they uh, they really specialize in communication. And they're based out of London, which sounds a little fancy, but this guy's great. So he, he is engaged now in how to tell those stories. And I think you guys know as good as me, it might, it might be plaques. It might be putting your phone up to it and getting that sort of tour. So we're working on all that stuff. Yeah. Yeah, so the second idea I had was if you didn't clean a bar and you could do a swimming pool, maybe a couch pool for the peers, maybe um, the bottom, the part of the, the uh, bar that's underwater could be like a that's right, or as my son says, a glass bottom. No, yeah, she's talking about the barge pool. How do you basically, again, yeah. And we're thinking of time for the aquarium, and I think cool things can happen with that pool, so I agree with you. We want to bring it to the next step. Yeah. Well, um, South Lake Union is right now going through an amazing transformation, and a lot, you know, some of that relates to Amazon, who has moved their headquarters there and about 10,000 employees, and some of it is the other parts of the biotech industry. There, we we are in dialogue with them related to this. There, your, I'm going to use the word your generation. There's people my age too, but. Amazon, when Amazon chose to locate in South Lake Union, and I was fortunate enough to be involved in the planning in South Lake Union and those discussions, they made a very conscious decision. We're going to be Central City. We're going to tie in. We want a great. So they, this is exactly what they want in terms of their city to be, to attract the type of workers, that, you know, the creative class, if you will, that they attract, that they want to live downtown, want to work downtown, and they need more open space, and they need more space like this. So we're very engaged with them, and they are very engaged and pleased with this is going on. Yep. Friends of Waterfront Seattle. Yep. Um, I think uh, there's a few things. The city has its own public process that we've been, and it's been fantastic. That said, there's a point where public agencies feel uncomfortable going too strong in the promotional end. You know, they, they want to talk good, but they have to always, the friends can just go all out. That's number one. Number two, events. Um, the friends can sponsor events. The friends can deal with philanthropy a lot better than the city. So philanthropy is a big part of it. And if they need to, and we haven't had to on this project, but we've had other ones where we've had friends, and one of them was in South Lake Union. If there needs to be a little hardball lobbying for a few of the council members, the friends can crank it up. The city staff can't do that. The friends can. And so if you look at the history of you know, friends of Millennium Park or look at friends of the High Line, you know, they were the, a lot of times these are formed when something bad's going to happen, a new road's going to be built, you know, a viaduct type thing, or when, in, in, in when they were going to tear down the elevated railroad, they, they formed then. These guys are forming on a positive side, but if they need to crank into a protectionist mode or a sell it mode, they can. So it's, it's fundraising. It's a little bit more creativity. They can just literally show up 
for right now, and uh, they can have a yoga. Let's go out on the piers and have a big thousand people show up for yoga. The city would it take them a year to figure out how to do that, and I don't mean that bad. I just they'd start thinking about well, we can't do that because we got to get. A, they can just do it. So like, like I said, they can cause trouble in a good way. Yeah, yeah. Yep. And the streetcar, are there plans to bring back to the Well, Seattle is a big streetcar city now. Like Portland, it's, it, it, Portland and Seattle are the two cities in the country that everyone goes to look at, but they're modern streetcars. We are looking at the waterfront, and the road I showed you is, the concept is, at least through now, we can put a streetcar and have it travel with the traffic just like it does in Portland in the Pearl District, just like it does in Seattle and South Lake Union. The issue, we are also looking at the old um, George Benson trolley cars and what it would take to modify those a bit so they can travel inside traffic so that they're ADA Accessibility Act compliant because they weren't before then and how you know the, the cost associated with that versus not doing it, or whether we run those cars on First Avenue. So we're looking at it hard. No decision has been made. And you're not alone. There's a strong interest group in Seattle who just loves those cars and has really good memories. And so we're looking at it. Yep. I think. Going back and changing your conceptual design and use of your publics. How are these all connected? So that you don't. Now, I, I, um, that's a really good question, and we we're looking at the environmental strategy. We're not going the EIS that we have to do the environmental we do. We're not going to say. Let's just start, let's start all over again. How we define the purpose and need of these guys do it for a living is going to be very tailored to what, what this community has been through for the last decade to say this is what we want. And then we'll, so we'll have a no-build alternative. We'll have this alternative. But I think we'll narrow down anything that gets us too far off track. Do you intend to keep your concept? Yes, process? yes. We intend to keep the concept and we intend tend to start where we can, building parts of it that don't require that big EIS. So some of those east-west streets, for example, we can build just with a, you know, a, a, a much simpler process, and we intend to do that. Yep. So the water park and the barge pool will be really nice in that small, narrow window of sunshine in the summertime that Seattle has. But most of the time it rains. Besides retail, what are going to be the main attractions? Well, again, you have um, two things first, and maybe it's because I grew up in Seattle. People still do stuff in the rain. It, 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 it's, it, it's, it's not the summer. I'm, not just, I'm just saying it's a challenge. But what we're doing, like the water park, the water park, and I just didn't show the pictures of it, all the water can go off, and it can become an open space that has Christmas celebrations on it. We, but we are looking at the idea of where do you have to have some level of rain protection, and I think that even along the walkway we're doing the same thing. So let's go back. The aquarium's there. We will have you know restaurants and, and the rest. The aquarium's expanding. Um, but we are not seeing, if you will, major new... Well, I take that back. We're talking with the Indian tribes about a, a museum down there, the same thing. So we're, we're looking at that. We're spending a lot of time on your question, which is what's the program year round, not just the summer. And I don't think I have all the answers to it. We know we're gonna we know in the summer this thing can even be immensely successful with concerts and the rest. What do we do outside of that? I think it's a good question. We don't have all the answers. Yeah. Um, I was up here during the uh, Seattle World's Fair. Yep. And I was born in Seattle up on Capitol Hill and I saw a lot of changes in it and before I spent a lot of time in California. But I am concerned about the monorail system. Is that going to be No. The existing monorail will stay. The idea of extending the monorail is not going to happen. Yeah, they, it, it, they took a run at it, and it, it uh, 
just didn't it just didn't work and it probably was a good idea that it didn't work and that's my bias yeah Yep. To the east. Yep. Of that, and I was wondering on the, what exactly is going on with that because I would imagine that the property values have Yeah, yeah they, they, they have, um, but some of the people have come in, and, you know, so they're, that's being taken into account. A lot of it is they're looking at some of those buildings, they've had their back turned against the viaduct, they've been limited retail at the base. They're looking at some get some great uh, ideas in terms of retail and restaurants and the rest, and even turning some of the office buildings down there into uh, residential, which is something we think is a really smart thing. We'd like more residential down that corridor, and the good news is the uh, developers are thinking the same thing. In fact, there, there'll be some incentives go in that, that encourage that happening. Yeah, I think you've had your hand up. Yeah, um, in your environmental review process, I know it's starting to happen now. Yep. Um, we the budget includes um, a, a, a line item, if you will, for mitigation. And so, uh, so some of what we will end up doing, even like in the seawall, some of the beach and habitat creation that we're doing, that's in the budget, that's already in the seawall budget, and we'll be doing the same type of thing as we look at the aquarium and the market and the rest. So that it's in our budget, and the assumption is that's why I said the numbers can look a little high. Some people look at the pure construction costs and go, "Why?" And that's part of that why the numbers there the way it is. There was a question over there. Yeah. Yep. Yeah, I think I, 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 we do. A lot of this, though there's new, um, some of the stuff on the waterfront is, uh, is redoing some of the old as well. Methune, I think you know, who's a really good leading edge in that area, their offices are on the waterfront, which is a plus. And they're the, uh, the architect for the uh, aquarium right now, which is a huge plus. Miller Hall is the uh, architect for the market. And again, if you're, if you're based in Seattle and you aren't good at leading edge technologies in, 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 in terms of green, something's wrong with you. So it's, it's a big theme of what we're doing. Um, we're actually drafting right now, I think what we're calling a sustainability signature that'll talk about how not just in the building end of it, but the infrastructure end of it, the green technology is infiltrated everywhere. Yep. Yep. What we did was we took James Corner, the, the lead designer on the public realm open space, and added him to the seawall team. So when the seawall builds the seawall, they're going to have to replace sidewalks and railings and the rest. James Corner's designing all of that. So there is that integration. It's a very good question. and. Early on, it wasn't that way, and this is one of those things that the Central Waterfront, com the steering committee, basically said that will happen. You know, this is you know, and and really make made a strong case for it. Um, and now they're fully integrated with the team, and uh, wonderful stuff's happening. Yep. 